This is uh, Morten from Inkish. Uh, I have a, uh, I would say, a tremendously big honor to talk to Shlomi from uh, Haikon in Israel. And uh, I can tell you that we had uh, like almost half an hour before we started this interview talking about the situation in Israel. We will not, probably not talk so much about that right now, but just be aware that this is also how and how dedicated the uh, Haikon and Shlomi and his team is that even in difficult times, uh, we have time to sit down and talk about something that is tremendously important for the industry, uh, uh, the digital transformation. So Shlomi, good morning, and, and thank you very much for taking time to talk to me. Good morning, Morten, and thank you very much for having me. Um, you reached out to me yesterday evening, and I don't hope, and I don't think you were upset, but you wrote read an article that I wrote where you said basically that there was too many uh, faulty assumptions and statements that you would like to talk about. And, and I think that it is important to understand that, that when a reporter writes, it's always with the limits of knowledge and background of uh, a story that you write something. So I never had any intention of writing anything that could uh, damage Haikon. As I've said, every time I talk to Haikon and every time I'm on camera, Haikon was, was the very first customer with Inky. So you have a very special uh, place in our heart. And I thought it could be great to talk about the situation at Hikon, but also how you see uh, the future for Hikon, because uh, the biggest and most important thing, in my opinion, is probably how to make sure that people have trust, because you need new investors, uh, you need more money, you need more customers, and, and everybody should have faith in, uh, in Hikon. So before we do that, maybe you give a little bit of background who you are, and, and uh, because oh. it's uh, a little, little bit more than four years ago, you became the, the CEO of Hikon, right, Shlomo? Yes, um, my background, uh, um, I guess, I, I've, uh, if I can summarize it in one sentence, I was fortunate enough to be part of multiple Israeli technology companies that have either created new markets or have transformed an existing market. And I'll name the few companies I was involved with. I was with Indigo in the early days. I was the uh, chief financial officer hired Alon Barshani, who took over my role, and I became the chief operating officer. And later on, of course, he became the legendary HP Indigo GM. Um, I was a CEO of a software company that does all the broadcast graphics you see on channels like CNN and CBS, NBC, and the bigger ones. I mean, all the graphics you see in the football games and the Olympic games. I mean, it's basically a company that... Uh, uh, it's an Israeli company, a flight simulator uh, uh, subsidiary who did that. Uh, I spent 15 years in North America, uh, involved in a company also in the telemedicine space that have entered remote monitoring of patients with heart problems. The company was acquired by Philips. Mm -hmm. I moved back to Israel in uh, 2011 and became the CEO of the largest center of innovation in the state of Israel out of Tel Aviv University. Um, some of the you mentioned Israeli technologies that we're using in this uh, recording. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many technologies that the world is using today, like the USB disk on chip, uh, was invented by uh, uh, professors from Tel Aviv University. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just one example. There are many, and obviously we're not going to take the time, but uh, we brought major corporations like Tata and Temasek and ma major others uh, to invest in Israel. And in 2019, I was approached by Benny Landa. Um, who is, of course, an ind industry leader, a leader uh, and a shareholder, early shareholder in Hikon. And he was telling me about the, the last mile of the pr production process of packaging that is actually needs to be transformed from analog to digital. And of course, Cytex did the pre-press, Indigo is the, the pioneer in the digital print, and Hikon is and still is, was and still is a pioneer in the, uh, in the uh, finishing. Uh, in the digital finishing. So I, I must be be honest that at first I, it was a lukewarm because I mean, anyone that goes through an experience of capital equipment company, mm -hmm. don't rush to do it again. <laughs> and uh, especially to those of you who knows the history of Indigo. But when I mm -hmm. came to Hikon and Benny said, why don't you go and see some customers? Mm -hmm. And when you see some customers, then tell me if you're interested. And when I met the customers, what struck me is that yes, lasers will always be slower than analog, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not analog. Mm -hmm. But what struck me 
is that the market dynamics actually requires different tools for different jobs. And there is a growing numbers of jobs that are becoming inefficient on analog. So the vision of actually having a side by side, you know, if you're a manufacturing plant and I look at your job basket, and by the way, this turned to reality today, we're seeing it in every single sales process. We go in, we do the analysis, and we realize together with the client that 20, 30% of the job basket can be much more efficient on digital asset. Mm. And uh, by doing so, you're gaining multiple ways. A, you're freeing up capacity from analog, so you can bring more longer jobs. Mm. B, you can actually do much more effectively the shorter and mid, mid-run jobs, okay? Um, uh, which allows you sometimes to offer things you cannot offer with analog, mm. okay? I mean, in terms of the the uh, specialty, the cuts, the uh, all sorts of things that uh, the unpacking experience, the unboxing experience, the locking mechanism, things that many brands today are defining as mm-hmm. major driver for them for differentiation. Mm-hmm. So it's really not about looking at, okay, Bobst is doing it at such and such sheets per hour and Hikon is only half of that. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> what really matters is the throughput Mm. at the end of the production line mm. and the overall manufacturing efficiency. So mm. that struck me mm. and I fell in love with the company and, mm. you know, Aviv and Mickey started it. They had a very bold vision, mm. um, which, by the way, I don't think I would have had, but I was lucky to meet these guys. Um, and in the course of the last four years, we transformed the company. We moved away from commercial print, which was the primary customer base of Hikon when I came. And Mm. today it's primarily folding carton and corrugated. In fact, 60, 70% of our customer base today is is folding carton and corrugated. Mm. This wasn't the case. Um, No, 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 because when it started, it was totally different. As I also wrote in the first article I wrote, when you look back at Dupa uh, 2016, I mean, you saw the beautiful dresses made of paper. That was before your time, of course. But and then you saw, uh, I, I mean, maybe you could imagine you in a paper dress. No, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you no. know what? You yeah. can actually. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> it happened, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and see, the, so you can size everything to to fit uh, anybody, you know. Uh, so seriously, it was uh, it was amazing. And uh, as I also wrote, I think that it was fantastic to see what laser could do and an eye opener to many. And basically, you transformed uh, also your communication into the corrugated and to the to the folding carton business. And um, as you know, we have visited quite a few Hikon customers during the past years, and I agree with you that everybody is very happy with it. And everybody has also started to find the niches where the Hikon machines are really efficient and, and interesting to 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 use uh, as an add-on to the current business. I will get back to that in a second. Um, just moving a little bit back to to when you started at Hikon, um, <laughs> taking over, let's say, uh, a company that has been, let's say, a it is in many ways still a startup because, as you say, you are. Uh, generally, uh, revolutionizing, what's it called? I cannot even say that, but revol- revolutionizing. Yeah. Precisely. The, 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 the digital finishing and, and all the opportunities you can do with that. But at the same time, when you, when you, when you took, uh, the position as uh, CEO of, uh, of Hikon, uh, how did you see? Because you had the Euclid, you had the, it started at the beams, was just around that time as well. Uh, how was the adaption? Because I mean, I take that that before you went to the IPO that we're going to talk about in a second as well, uh, there was a kind of history on 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 sales and and how many people you needed and and also how much cash you needed in order to make sure that you could actually end up positive on the market. So tell me a little bit about the the first things you kind of looked into after visiting customers. So uh, f- first of all, uh, I, I would say uh, it was very critical for me to make sure that I'm selling. Uh, a solution to a problem mm. and not a technology that is looking for uh, a problem to solve. Okay. Sounds, sounds fair. <laughs> and um, I realized that um, while the vast majority of Hikon's early customers were in the commercial print, we're not really bringing much value to commercial print. They don't do much packaging 
And even the packaging they do is very light packaging. These are really not packaging companies. Mm-hmm. So the first decision was let's look at the pipeline. And surprisingly or not, 95% of my pipeline initially was commercial print. I said, guys, forget it. Mm-hmm. We're moving away from commercial print. Yes, we're setting a high bar because folding carton are you know, very strict in terms of the requirements for quality and throughput. And all that stuff but you know what that's how we build a company to last so that was I would say uh, a light lightning number one the second thing which we realized and actually that started before my time but we solidified it and actually accelerated it is the realization that while in folding carton we solve a problem the market might not be as ready as it is in corrugated in corrugated the pain seemed to be much more obvious. Um, our technology, because it was built for folding carton, didn't have the limitation of accuracy and quality that we may have had in the early days with the folding carton. And we learned that it's much easier to sell into the corrugated market. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that so, so first of all, identifying the go-to market, I mean, which are the market segments that are prime as far as their need. For the high con technology then the second thing i'm a financial guy in my background okay this is where i started and when you sell capital equipment you have to be able to demonstrate roi which is reasonable and unlike my early days at indigo where it was a serious challenge to show an roi with high con if you just take the cost of the dies the conventional dies and if you take the setup time And with all the advancements that conventional players have introduced into this market, there is still tremendous amount of savings. Not to mention this, the cycle time. You know, I'm talking to a big player in, in the West Coast. I won't mention the name. Mm-hmm. Average waiting for dye is three to five days. Mm-hmm. Average manufacturing time of high con dyes is five minutes. Mm-hmm. You can't even compare that. So I talked to the CMO of the company, not the operation, it's a slow-mo. We lose business today because we are, we're, we're, we're challenged by the turnaround time. And this is where Hycon can help. So the fact that ACFA are saying they can do 11,000 sheets an hour, I want to see it, by the way. It's still on paper. We all know how these promises evolve. I, can, I will film it for you in uh, just a few weeks' time, I, so then fine. I can uh, it, show it, you. It, it's, it's fine. I mean, it, mm. it, it, and, but I can tell you that if you look at all the digital printing providers today, you know, the HP Cytex, I agree. Right, yeah. the Nozomi, the Barbaran, I mean, you, you're talking about 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. This is the speed you're talking about. Mm. And in fact, the vast majority of Icon customers have a high attachment rate for digital printing. Mm-hmm. Very high. I would say more than 80%. We have about 20%, you know, conventional printing, mm-hmm. not necessarily digital. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's the Durst, it's the EFI, it's the Barbaran, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. it's the HP Cytex. Mm-hmm. And some of our customers have bought multiple Hycon next to HP Cytex. So it happens there. So the third thing that uh, was very critical for us to develop is a business model. Of course. To develop a business model that has a razor and razor blade not identical to print because we don't have consumables per sheet mm-hmm. we have consumables per job mm-hmm. but we have transformed our business model from selling a la carte consumables to selling price per job mm-hmm. so all of a sudden we have a razor and razor blade mm-hmm. okay our razors has a very nice margin mm-hmm. and our blades have even more more significant uh, uh, margins and mm-hmm. we have customers today that generate several hundred thousand dollars a year in consumables mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. a very high gross margin mm. and that is that is good and that was also one of the things i wrote about because i mean if you look at the gillette model that you refer to is basically uh, if you look at almost all digital toner based print today is a kind of gillette model where you buy a piece of hardware and then you that you you make money on the consumers i must admit that when i wrote it i thought that okay um i th- i knew that on the dart and on the on the consumables that you have on that and that was going into be like a consumable so it was similar to the to the toner model of 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 digital print 
but I must also admit I didn't think it was that big because I thought it would be something that was like a, a showstopper. But what you're basically saying is because it's the cost is less than a, a traditional die and because you have way faster turnaround time, then basically that is part of the business model understanding that the turnaround time is more valuable than whatever variable cost you have on it. That, that's it, what you it, say, it's, basically. It's right? all the above. I, you know, if an average die, it really depends in which country, but you've got die anywhere from 400, 500 euro to 2000 euro. Yeah. And we charge 90 euro per job. Yeah. Okay, now, um, so there is a huge price difference. So even without the turnaround time, there's a, there is a tremendous ROI. I can tell you, and the biggest of testament course, yeah. to that, probably if you would have mm -hmm. spoken to me two years ago, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be as... Uh, determined, but no, because seen... it is relatively new, right? I mean, you, you in the beginning you paid for the consumables, now you change it into a, in, a variable in the cost model. Basically, before right? I came, it was an a la carte business model, and, and I'll tell you what happened when you send an a la carte, you force on the customer bad behavior because they're always looking to save on consumables. Yeah, because it's okay, I can do cut instead of crease. Never mind the quality, never mind the box strength. Mm. So you force patron, behavior mm. patron, which mm. are actually against quality, against mm. mechanical strength. By mm. shifting to price per job, which is a fixed number, mm. you solve that problem. You solve, you solve actually multiple problems. First of all, there is clarity. You don't have to calculate how many meter of crease and how many meter of cut. There is a fixed cost to a job, per job. 90 yeah. euro. Ninety-five dollars, ninety euro. Mm. Um, number two, there is uncertainty between you and the customer. Mm. Uh, you can price it. Mm -hmm. Number three, you have no incentive to steal and buy IP mm. from anyone else. You would pay me regardless, the ninety bucks yeah. or yeah. the ninety euro. So there are a lot of benefits. Yeah. I guess fast forward. This has been, by the way, the last couple of years. Eighty-five percent from our revenue today is price per drop. Eighty-five percent. Okay. And more importantly, if you look at the nine months of 2023 versus the nine months of 2022, we mm. had an increase of more than 30% year over year, 3-0. Mm. In a year which is a very tough one with global economy slowdown and everything. So 30% increase is pretty good. Now, if you mm. break it down to segments, corrugated, 70%. Mm. year over year mm. but uh shlomo just to i mean i get the model and i understand that part of it but um if we, if we turn the clock back to to when you introduced uh um Hikon to the to the stock market right uh i read the, the 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 presentation for the ipo and i think that that you know the digital transformation and uh, as Lando also said, everything that can go digital will go digital. Um, I was just thinking because I mean, from the IPO, you had a, a probably I guess that you had like some kind of uh, um, a roadmap for your product development and, and also how you want to do that. And if I understand you correctly, it is a huge advantage for you to get as many machines in the market as possible because uh, if such a high number of the revenue comes from consumables. Uh, uh, of course, you need to have as many machines in the market to really have that significant growth. Uh, and the money that has been burned since you basically got the IPO till now has not really in, reflected such big growth as far as I can see. I mean, if you look at the at, at the numbers of, of the revenue of Hikon, it's not, it's not, I mean, I understand that the market situation has is, is not in your favor because it is still, I, I wouldn't say expensive, but quite a lot of money that you need to invest in order to get that technology. So, so what? What? I don't know if anything went wrong, but how is it compared to the plan you had? Because now you're in a situation where you had, at least the the. I started writing you because I saw this article in in um, um, this Israeli tech, uh, C tech, I think it's called, where I saw that basically that that the cash flow that you had was based on. Uh, revenue sales and still a little bit on the credit from the from the banks. I, so, I mean, that is, I guess, not an ideal situation for Hikon to be in, right? So let me let me try and address that. I mean, first mm -hmm. of all, you know, you have to. I'll take you back to 2020. Mm -hmm. You know, we took the company public in uh, November of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, 
if you recall, that was the year of the COVID, right? I do remember. <laughs> and we were supposed to be, all of us, in June at Drupal. Mm -hmm. There was no Drupal. Right? So everything was kind of leading up to, to, to that if Drupal leading, had happened. Right. Mm. So everything was leading up to Drupal. In fact, you know, I joined the company in June of 2019. In mm. fact, there was no cash, major cash infusion after I came. Mm -hmm. And I realized how big is the turnaround I have to invest in. Mm. And I will explain to you exactly where the money, money went. Okay. Mm. So, and the only venue to raise funding at the time that was available at the time where the world was shut down. I mean, the world was caught like deer in a headlight. Mm. There was no way to fly out of Israel. I mean, people didn't know that they can actually do anything on Zoom. I mean, mm. remember, I mean, now we're, this is a natural thing, but... Yeah, but it's true that yeah, we, we it, it, almost, it was, oh, sometimes you forget that that was like... We take it for granted, exactly. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. at the time, we, uh, that was... The, it became apparent that there maybe there is a way to raise money in the public market. Mm. Now I can tell you, yes, we did go public. It was it in the long term, it's not the right thing for, for Hikon. It's mm. not. Because mm. the Israeli stock market is not Nasdaq. <laughs> it doesn't favor tech companies in general. There is mm. no coverage. There is no trading. There is no I mean the float is minimal. So, yeah, because I've seen that that sometimes it's it's only like thirteen or fifteen exactly, or eighteen thousand exactly. shares that are, are traded. So so I can I can see uh, see that, and that was like one of the big surprises I had. Like uh, like, like just after the announcement was there was a, a certain a few days where it was like six seven hundred thousand shares, and I was just like, that's amazing because uh, I didn't see any major announcements or anything like that. So again, that was like. Uh, it, it, it's it. I can tell you as 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 a guy that have, this is my fourth IPO. Okay. Mm. I've okay, done so multiple you know. IPOs. Yeah. So I'm not strange to this, but, mm. and, and my first IPO when I still had dark hair was in the Israeli stock exchange. But if you look at, uh, at the Israeli high tech arena, most of the successful Israeli high tech, um, in Israel are traded in the U S market. Mm. That's the market that appreciate technology the most. That's the market that has, uh, um, uh, you can create demand if you perform. Uh, and, and what's happening, and I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but you know, you raise, there is a saying that you raise money when you can, not necessarily when you need. Hikon could have raised much more than it raised in 2020. Mm -hmm. If it would have, we would have been in a much better situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I won't go beyond that. You can do, you can imagine what I mean, or you can think yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Now, what happened since? First of all, remember, we made a conscious decision because we want to build a billion dollar company mm -hmm. to sell our products to customers that have problems that they're looking to solve. And the folding carton and the corrugated are market like that. Those mm -hmm. markets actually have a three shifts operation requirement, 24 seven. I mean, this is not something that a typical digital equipment is capable of coping with. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm 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 saying this very proudly. Mm -hmm. I can tell you th that in the course of 21 and 2022, the vast majority of our resources went to redesign big subcomponents of the Beam product that was launched in 2016, Drupa. Mm -hmm. As painful as it is, Morton. Yeah. So by the end of this year, all our customers are going to be with the latest and greatest. Most of my customers are working two, three shifts. Many of my customers are buying repeat business, repeat uh, machines. So, and that was a painful process. <clears throat> so was it to, necessary? Absolutely, yes. So to understand it correctly, uh, this is basically a situation where a, um, a quite big chunk of the money that you got from the IPO were used to basically make sure that the technology were more industrial scale so when it was the market started to to buy again the machines that you sell is on a way high level but that is that is of course good because that leads to a situation where you have a more sellable product the problem is that that time it has taken to do that and i would also say if i should 
if I should uh, tease you a little bit, uh, maybe no, the commu- maybe the communication about that kind of industrial scaling of the bee machines should have been communicated better. Because w- w- when I started writing about these stories, for me, it's like you you need you need to get more shareholders on board. You need to to have trust from the market in order to sell. I mean. I guess a few people will invest in the machine if they don't believe in the company will exist in a few years time, right? So, so that was why this, this is important to talk about when you do like upscaling of technology and make sure that it is more industrial scale that people knows about it. And, and I, th- I think that is great because I also can tell you, and, and now I can say it with even more confidence is that, that the only thing I have heard negatively about the, 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 the I can't remember if it was a Euclid or B machine was actually the industrial scale uh, of, especially of the, of the, of the delivery system, right? So I just think that it's a f- fantastic that you address this and, and, and it needs, and you say it needs to be done if you want to run uh, three shifts 24 so- seven. Yeah, so, so so that's one element. So one element, Morton, was to really uh, deliver a product to the market that the market can respect and appreciate. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you that today, you know, we've replaced the paper handling system. Okay, we've uh, we've done major changes. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean the writing system, mm-hmm. the consumables fifth generation. I mean there are many changes that were implemented. We did communicate it to our customers. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that uh, um, our customers are very appreciative and supportive of Hikon's commitment. I mean, you've been to Team, you've done a wonderful job. By the way, thank you for that. Um, I know you're doing. Our- I know you're doing a wonderful job, and I know customers appreciate it. What I'm talking about here is that I didn't see like a public statement about that. That is where we have. To done our we could R&D. have done a, yeah. probably we could have done a better job. Mm. Okay, yeah, I'm so not, that, I'm not blaming. I'm not blaming, but yeah. I'm just I'm just saying that I appreciate you saying that now because that is basically what you say is if if you buy a beam today, it's way more robust and way better for the industrial scale, which is part one of the trust in Hikon. Right now, you have machines that Absolutely. are even better. Right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So that that's an important uh, statement, and we probably could have done a better job in communicating it. And I can tell you that it cost us a lot of money. Mm. But I don't think you can be a successful company without having a happy customer base. That's true. It just doesn't work. Mm. The second chunk of the money, and um, um, we're on record here, so I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be um, careful. But you can imagine that with our unique position, in cutting and scoring, mm-hmm. which is really our core mm-hmm. uh, knowledge. Mm-hmm. By the way, you talked about the paper handling system. We sell today our beam to see nonstop with a paper handling system, which is not made by Hikon. It's made by a Spanish company okay. who does it to other major players in the market. Okay. This is not our core competence. No, no. It is what is inside, right? <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. We, we made a decision mm-hmm. that we need to focus on what we're good at. Mm. And what we're good at is the cutting, the creasing, and the stripping. These are the three areas where we are, uh, uh, our technology, our IP. Mm-hmm. We have about 80 patents mm-hmm. on those around those three areas. The second cash draining effort was developing future generation products. Yeah. Now, without getting into details, it's not necessarily about speed. Mm-hmm. It's about format size and it's about thickness Mm -hmm. and all I can tell you that uh, stay tuned and (laughs) you know we we announced the deal with BHS I'll say a few words about that even Mm -hmm. though you haven't asked me yet but I'll say a few words about it you know I think BHS obviously is the um, the thing I like about BHS is the fact that they recognize that there is so much you can actually introduce efficiencies on the corrugator. Mm -hmm. It's about the five days after. Mm -hmm. And the box plan 25 is how you take the five days Mm -hmm. and make them two days. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly where high-con technology can fit. Now, is it going to happen overnight? No. It will happen over time. And Mm high-con, I can tell you without getting into too much details, Mm -hmm. our technology is solid. We filed a lawsuit against a player in the marketplace. I can't say the name, but I can tell you that they're actually 
we reach to a settlement um, and they're paying us for every job that their customer is making. Okay, so Hikon's technology is very robust, very strong. And remember, and this is very important, we're not here to replace analog. It's no, about no. the right tool for the right job. Let me comment on that because that was one of the things I mentioned in my article was about the speed. And because we work uh, also quite close with BHS in many ways and also been digging quite a lot into the Box Plan 25 plan. The reason why I was wondering whether that was something that could be like both speed and also size was if you look, I think the smallest corrugator they do is 280 centimeters width. And I think the biggest one is 410 or something like that. And if you look at the, the new uh, jet line they're doing is basically planning to have the pre-printed liner as much as 50 square kilometer, uh, 50 square kilometers an hour, right? So that was why I was just saying that, okay, that f should fit. <laughs> I, I have not talked to anybody. I was just thinking logically, if you want to laser cut that in the future or even with crease lines and make sure that you get a finished product out of it, my logic was basically saying that, okay, then it needs to be faster because then it n does not become like a niche. And if you think of, of the BHS and, and you look at the corrugators, they are not, uh, I mean, they, they make boards, all the, the die cutting takes place in analog devices, typically afterwards, right, after being printed. And now they have printing inside the machine. So my logic was more like, okay, that makes sense from a BHS perspective. And, and I remember I spoke to some of your guys when I was uh, visiting uh, Hikon in Israel saying that is speed just, in quotation, just as a matter of how many lasers and how many mirrors you have in a machine. And I can't remember exactly, but as far as I remember, that was pretty much yes. But then, of course, it also gets more expensive, right? So, so, so that was the logic I was trying to put in, in front of it because the, when, when, when you made that announcement that BHS is a, a strategic partner, I thought that was the best use that, that Hikon could get because BHS is the leading uh, manufacturer of corrugating machines, right? So I, I thought that was really great. And then my, and maybe, maybe you're right that it doesn't need to be faster. I'm not 100% sure about it, but I mean, you have the experience, so I will, I will take your word on uh, it. <laughs> let, let me try and, 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 and shed some more light here. Mm -hmm. um, when we sell Hikon system today, and this is also new, mm -hmm. it wasn't like this when you met uh, Icon many years ago, mm -hmm. we don't sell a system, we sell a solution. Mm -hmm. Every system we sell come with a piece of software mm -hmm. that actually does two things. Number one, it looks at the job basket for the entire shift mm -hmm. and it will give you a recommendation. This do on the BOPS, this do on the Icon, this do on the analog, this do on the digital. Okay, number one. Number two, it will look at your job basket and will imposition the job in a way to optimize the number of make readies. Mm -hmm. So if the if in the typical world of analog, one make ready is one job, in the world of digital, you can have as many as the one chief make is. ready yeah. can be three jobs. Yeah, precisely. It really yeah. depends. Yeah. So the speed of the system is is becoming secondary. Yeah, that uh, that that's the point. So yeah. and so so the, what we're looking, I mean, we're looking actually upstream mm -hmm. with our software. We're not just looking at the isolated um, stage of the finishing. We're looking actually upstream mm -hmm. from the design to the print to the finish, and we give the the the, the production floor manager mm -hmm. recommendation how to divide the job basket for the day for mm -hmm. the shift. Mm -hmm. And what would be the most optimal way? So it is really about the right tool for the right job and customer gets it. Mm. I can tell you today we're having dialogues and stay tuned as far as announcements. Uh, some big announcements to come in terms of large prospects that we're working on. Um, uh, so, so, so just to finish your answering your question, a lot of the money went on developing new platform. Mm -hmm. One of the decisions we had, we were forced to do now mm -hmm. And trust me, this is probably the toughest thing to do for a CEO. Is cut R&D and cut people, right? <laughs> yeah. Cut people and mm -hmm. doing it in a time of war, yeah. Morten. Yeah. This is, I can tell you that I lost many nights of sleep mm -hmm. because none of the people that I had to ask to leave mm -hmm. have done anything bad. No, that's true. Haikon managed to build an amazing team. Mm -hmm. We, I believe we managed to keep the core team mm. and hopefully I told the guys, you know, one of my, I'm on a mission here. Mm. 
I want to finish Drupa strong. And I want to be able to call all of you to come back. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have a lot of work. I mean, th- th- what happened to us, Morton, is that on one hand, we made a decision, and maybe we were too cocky, I don't know, to develop the next generation platform for the, for the uh, corrugated, knowing that this is a 30 to 50 million dollar undertaking, okay? Know, yeah. Knowing we don't have it, mm-hmm. but we said, okay, you know what? We had good year, our products are selling well, but then we hit the global economy slowdown. Mm-hmm. With an interest rate of seven and eight and nine percent, you know, I'm talking to major players today, they have a capital freeze. Mm-hmm. They throw 500 million euro mm-hmm. net cash mm-hmm. to the bottom line every year and they have a cash, mm-hmm. a, a capital freeze. I mm-hmm. mean, which is crazy. Yeah. You wish you could just have uh, 20% of that for, you, for, for selling new machines. That would be nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would be okay even with, with less than that, yeah. but you're right. But uh, so Shlomo, think- uh, uh, just to 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 also because uh, we are running into the thirty fifth minute yeah. here, um, the future because I think that is where it is more interesting because with with the announcement of uh, uh, the current uh, investors um, in this sixty days period uh, looking for new investors but also have a minimum cash uh, injection of two and a half million dollars, and also the the sales both to your graphic and to Westrock uh, is that enough to keep you afloat or, or how do you see yeah. because i mean uh, the burning rate uh, on on uh, yeah. Hikon has so been let relatively me explain. high first right? of all yeah i will explain first of all to, to correct um, um, a statement we indeed sold two units one to west rock and one to euro graphics mm-hmm. by the way euro graphics is a scandinavian company they i know them a, and we are filming from there in january so maybe it's already fantastic. there when we get there yeah fantastic i mean they're great in addition to that, we sold two beam to C's. I cannot disclose to who. Okay. For four million. Okay. Congratulations. And I can tell you that that four million actually was already paid for. So okay. it's all going to the bottom line. Okay. I would say the combination of the steps we made, the cost cutting is close to $20 million impact. Wow. Okay. Okay. All because, in all. Because that is great to know because basically when I looked at the, the let's say, the last fiscal reports also for the quarterly and half year, basically that is in the range that you need because you have also stated that you want to be profitable in 24, right? And that is like, yeah, no, that is a relatively stated, high turnaround, I would say. Right? Yeah, so so we made, again, the, 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 the focus right now is moving from future to present. Yeah. Our focus right now is to go strong to Drupa. Our strong, uh, our focus right now is to cement the relationship with BHS, leverage the relationship with BHS. Again, for us, the fact that BHS acknowledged Icon. Oh man! And I can't big give you specifics, yeah. Yeah. but they have. This is a, a hard commitment. Okay, yeah. I, I won't get into more. Mm-hmm. You're gonna see them in our supply chain. Mm-hmm. You're gonna see them in our go-to market, and. Again, it's up to us to 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 uh, build this relationship and take them forward. And you, and you hinted that Bob's is a stakeholder there. Mm-hmm. Yes, they are. Mm-hmm. And by the way, not such a small one. It's, okay, I thought it was a tiny one. Okay, <laughs> uh, you can find yourself. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, obviously, I'm not. I can't I'm remember not, that. I, can't disclose I, I didn't think it was too important. I just wanted to state for disclosure. Basically, well, it, okay. it's an interesting fact to know that the gorilla in the Korg in the um, analog market is somehow indirectly involved with Hikon. So uh, that must I think be nice, that's right? A, that's <laughs> well. Uh, again, I, I can tell you that, as I mentioned to you, I've been uh, leading four IPOs mm. in pretty much every company I've been to. There was a happy end. Mm. I don't intend to spoil that statistics. I okay? can imagine that. What do you think a company like BHS could be a potential investor? Now you are ex- extending the capital of. I know. If you know something, you can't say anything. If you don't know, you can speculate that like the rest of us, right? I mean, I can tell you that uh, um, any one of the large players there could be potential. has potential to become an investor in Hikon. Mm-hmm. I don't think there is a room for all of them. No. <laughs> but uh, I certainly believe that the more traction we create in the marketplace in mm-hmm. terms of the customers that we sell to, mm-hmm. the more uh, solidified our business model is, you know, most of these companies do not have a recurring business model. Mm-hmm. And everybody wants we it. We do. Yeah, everybody wants we it. We do. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I do believe, you know, it's a marathon. 
unfortunately we had a lot of we made a lot of mistakes along the way but show me a capital equipment company that did it right the first time <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the nature of this beast and mm. it is a beast, mm. definitely in a, in a time like today. So the long story short, do I have a sufficient cash? Never. <laughs> I always want to have more. Mm. Okay. Uh, we will need to go to the market at some point, but I'm hopeful to do it on better economical conditions and better, better for performance, mm. uh, that I believe we're capable of carrying. So, uh, And I guess last statement, if you look at any of the large companies in this, in, in this world, in, in, our, in, in our world, the pyramid is that the R&D is like this mm. and sales and marketing is like this. Mm. Highcon pyramid is like this. Of course. You know, my R&D was like this. You're an Israeli like company. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Couldn't help it. <laughs> no, no, you're right. I mean, we, we're good in, in what we're good at. We're mm. good in technology. We're not. We need help in, 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 in scaling mm. and, and a company like BHS, mm. if we do our job properly together, yeah, it would, would allow be a us game to scale. Changer. Yeah. Uh, last question from my side, uh, which is very important to me. Um, do you think that we have touched upon the things that annoyed you a little bit about the Arctic? Do you feel that we have got around the things that, that you want to touch upon? Because I think it's important for me. I, that I we think have... you have given me opportunity to address all the issues mm. again. Uh, um, we, we talked about uh, the cash situation and the change in focus. We talked about our future roadmap. And mm -hmm. by the way, I can tell you that, and we can talk about it after this call. Mm -hmm. uh, we can coordinate with you a pre-screening of something we will be announcing next year. Oh, man. Okay? Yes. Now you're teasing uh, me a lot. You know that, Shlomo. I am right? teasing you a lot. <laughs> I'm not doing it with everyone, so you better take me up on this opportunity. Um, but I, I, uh, we, we are, we are definitely going to talk about some more things. Mm -hmm. Uh, we talked about the right tool for the right job because it, it did, I mean, your focus on how oh, I could needs to be faster. I, I think there is more into that statement that I hope we were able to clarify in this conversation. You, you did clarify it fine. And I, I, you know, sometimes when you write something, uh, I, I a little bit afterwards, I feel a little bit stupid because I know that the job diversity is one of the strengths of Hikon. And you know, we have known each other for for as a company, we've known each other for for ten years. And you know, when 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 sometimes you just take things for, like you assume that everybody knows, but but you should of course clarify everything you do in both in writing and and, and filming. And that was also why I reacted uh, fast to your message yesterday because. Uh, I have absolutely zero interest in talking anything about Hikon or anybody in the industry down. I just need to, I just think it's important that we have these conversations. And I think that today uh, we had this conversation that we should have had, as you also mentioned before, uh, writing articles because uh, you know that, that, that the word of the press, uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist in everything I write. Uh, so sometimes it's assumption, sometimes it is a background, sometimes it's also the, the banging on the pipes, basically, what, what do you hear and things like that. But here, I spoke to uh, the CEO of uh, Hikon, so I mean, I, I can't get much better uh, answers, can I? <laughs> I, I, you know, what? I, there are some questions I don't have answers myself every day, mm. and that's the way it should be. So thank you very much for the opportunity, Morten. Always. It was really a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for giving me the opportunity. Always. And I'll take you up on your words uh, when you come to Israel. Okay, I look forward to that, and I will look into flight tickets very soon. <laughs> Let me know. Thank you very take much. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.